Welcome to another episode of the Sage Real Stories podcast. I am so thrilled to introduce you to our guest today. Melissa Bernstein is a wildly successful entrepreneur, creative, working mother of six. In 1988, Melissa and her husband co-founded Melissa and Doug. You may have heard of it. <laughs> Almost every household has used her products for their children. They built this company out of her parents' garage, and in the years that followed, built Melissa and Doug into a billion-dollar brand. She estimates that she's conceived more than 6,000 toys in the last three decades. This creative process was the silver lining in a duality in her being, which also struggled through existential depression and despair. After a journey of self-discovery, she's using her unique gift of creativity to bring a new category of well-being products into the world that will help adults relieve stress through the wonder of sensory immersion. The best, in my opinion, because it's very sage, part of Melissa's story is her intense dedication to helping others through her learnings of her journey. I quote her book, Lifelines, which is a book not to be missed. If I could solve the puzzle of my own life, perhaps I could help others do the same. And she shares her story as she puts it, to forge a sense of kinship with similar souls who perhaps in hearing her journey, allow them to forge ahead. It's incredible. Mm, Melissa is the epitome of success in so many ways. And the beauty of Sage Real Stories is to see that even someone from the outside who you would never know otherwise unless they shared their journey, you would not know that they have these human struggles that we all share. Real struggles that bring them to a breaking point even, but they were able to forge ahead. And when we hear these stories, it can allow us to perhaps have a little more hope that we too can forge ahead to success. And Sage is the wisdom from sharing our stories, saying our stories. Welcome to the Sage Real Stories podcast, where we are hearing from real women who have a story to share. We face many different challenges as we navigate through this thing called life. But no matter what it is, someone has been there, has been through those woods and charted a path. These stories can be so valuable. They can inspire us, empower, make us feel like we aren't alone. At Sage, we're taking it one step farther, and we are connecting you with that woman who has the story you need to hear. If there is a speaker you hear on this podcast series that resonates with you, email hello at sagelink.com and we will connect you. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy this Sage Real Story. Grace and right, the way of love you Start anywhere you like. Tell us a little bit about Melissa's journey. Sure. Well, I think like most of our journey, you know, it started with experiencing who I truly was, which is a very deeply sensitive, introverted, heady, ruminative, creative. Uh, and having that personality that led to those creative qualities be very much stigmatized by society. So because I can see things in my head, right? I see ideas, I see verses, I see products fully finished. I can get into my imagination and also ponder different realities, like what it's like to die, like, and ask questions like, what is the meaning of life? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life if we're ultimately just sort of going to die? Uh, and things that to me, you know, made no sense as a toddler when I started to ask these questions. Wow. That when, young. Yeah, that, that young. I mean, I remember like my first memory is thinking, 
what am I supposed to do while I'm here? And I wrote some really unsettling verses, even when I was five, like the burden of myself is almost more than I can bear. Yet rather than slip further down this mountain of despair, I will simply cry for help and hope an angel, here's my plea, or I'll not survive much longer and succumb to misery. You wrote that when you were five? I did. I did. I felt this really deep sense of meaninglessness and this struggle to understand why I was here. And unfortunately, it was deep. It was, I call it the drumbeat of mortality. Like I could hear the drumbeat, like you are supposed to do something while you're here, but what it was, I had no idea. And because of that, I was really, really unsettled almost all the time. But when I showed some of that darkness to the extrinsic world that wants us all to be happy and shiny and okay, uh, the message I got was very clearly like, whoa. And understandably, by the way, you know, it was dark thought. It's people don't want to go there. And I think many people, because when I heard, you know, heard this part of your journey, I, I read about it. It really resonated with me because I have these thoughts, but no one, I have not found anyone that doesn't say, whoa, that, that reaction, just maybe just, you know, live life or maybe just don't go there because it's a very uncomfortable concept. It is. These are questions that really have no answers. So, or they, they have answers that are unique to us. Right. And it requires a lot of self discovery and reflection. So I think when the people in the world heard it, they were like, oh gosh, she, there's something going on with her. Like, don't go near her one. And two, like tell her that she's not even supposed to be thinking about things like that. As a, as a child, people would say to me, like, you're a child. Like, why are you thinking such thoughts? They were trying to be kind and helpful. They were like, just go out and play, be like the other kids. Like you have time to ask those questions and it's not now. And of course, you know, I would think even at that young age, I would think, well, don't they think I want to be carefree? Like, do they think I want to be thinking nihilistic thoughts as a you know little kid? I don't, but of course I didn't know how to process those thoughts. So instead needing, because we biologically need to be accepted and to matter and belong, knowing that who I truly was, wasn't going to be acceptable and fit in. I needed to create a persona of someone who, who could fit in and belong. And that's what I did. Mm. How did that feel to live that kind of not inauthentic really life? That well, you know, I, I was unconscious of it. So the truth was because I needed so badly to fit in. I remember that was sort of one of the dualities too, was I was so different and I was so stigmatized when I came out as myself. You know, I would mutter to myself. I was always looking up because my thoughts, I can see them. So I'm always like gazing upward. You'll probably even see it during this conversation when I'm thinking because I, I'll see it. Um, and I was weird, you know, I'm, I'm weird because I have lots going on in my, my mind. Uh, and you know, when I wasn't accepted for it immediately, unconsciously, my fight or flight was then I'm going to become what you want me to become. Mm -hmm. And that's what I became. I became, I focused on what I call the three P's, um, her pleasing, becoming this person that had no needs of her own but literally served others until I had literally nothing left to give, which leads to martyrdom where you have this deep undercurrent of resentment built up because although initially it might be selfless to serve, the truth is unless we are serving ourselves as well uh, and, and refilling our, you know, our well of giving, we become bereft and we're serving from an empty well. So that was the first. Then the second was perfectionism, which was if I can't be accepted as me with my innate you know, qualities, I'll have to be accepted by my achievements. And, and this was the most, um, I would say the most harmful of all the things I did because 
it became very black or white to me. A hundred was perfect. 99 was not. Mm. And my whole life was resting on being perfect. And there was no acceptance of the imperfectness. When was that starting for you? Right from childhood all the way through? Believe it or not, it started when I was in, well, I know for a fact when I was in first grade, my teacher uh, called my parents in for a meeting because she was so worried about me. And I, I started school young, so I was like five. She said, we have a real problem with, my name was Missy, my nickname for Melissa. She said, Missy has a real problem. She cannot tolerate any form of failure. She said, even if we ask an open-ended question and like she doesn't get the pat that she's 100% right, she immediately dissolves into fits of, of hysterics. Wow. Uh, so she she warned my parents. She said, if, if this doesn't change, she's going to really... Um, have a lot of trouble in life because, you know, she's going to, she's going to ultimately fail. And if failure is consistent with being completely devalued and worthless, then um, it's going to lead to something awful. And it did, it, it it was the thing that really almost took me, took me out. Um, And then the, the last was performance because, you know, when you are hiding who you are, which is a lot of darkness. I used to believe I was all darkness. Like I actually had a completely dark self, mm-hmm. but I had to hide so it, and, opposite, isn't it? <laughs> and feign this, this shininess. Um, so I had to always put on a, a performance, like I'm great. Everything's fine. Oh, you know, never, ever letting anyone see an inkling of what was really churning and bubbling beneath that f- wow. fake shiny facade. Wow. You'd fit in per you would have fit in perfectly Oops. with the social media trap as a teenager, putting all your highlights. And, you know, it reminds me of, you know, the fact that the external validation, this is what it sounds like to me. You just needed external validation because you were not internally valid. You had no internal validation because no one was telling you it was okay to be you. So you exactly. really adapted to needing that validation extra. I did. My, my, my beliefs became no one will ever accept me as I truly am. I am a puppet to be manipulated by others. And I can't trust anyone because no one will really allow me to share my truth. The sense of belonging or the concept of belonging. Um, I would love for you to jump then to the moment. So this sounds like it persisted throughout until when, when was the moment where Melissa was freed because you realized that you had others like you, that there was a place for you to belong actually as you were. Believe it or not, it wasn't until I was 48 years old. So, yeah. And I, and it, by the way, it was totally unconscious. You know, I created a facade, I created a persona that served me really well. And I thought it was my life. And, you know, anyone who is existentially depressed, I believe is a, is a, an achiever because we have such a need to make meaning and leave a legacy that I wasn't, you know, sitting in bed by any means I was conceiving. If it wasn't toys, it was children. Uh, and I was building a very busy, frenetic life and engaged in what I call the feudal race. So I built this life where I was, there wasn't a moment of free time because any time I would sit still, that drumbeat of mortality would start to, to rise and I could feel it. I literally could feel it like this darkness starting to take over. So my coping mechanism, again, subconsciously was to just keep moving and not get in bed until I was so exhausted that I literally just dropped. And I get and that. I, I personally get that. That is amazing. Yes. And because it, it's this feeling of, you had this feeling of, I have to make the most out of this life. Because did you feel like it was short? Did you feel like you only had such a small amount of time? Did that play into it? Or oh, yes. You? Yeah. The, the, the clock ticking was incessant. And in fact, what it also did is it made me look at other people who I thought were wasting away and squandering their time and living lives of like hedonism. It made me disgusted. 
with others. And again, I couldn't share it. I wrote about it. You know, I have an entire chapter in my book on hypocrisy, right? And I couldn't understand how others could live their lives so freely when time was, you know, wasting away. The sands of time were just passing through. So yes, I felt, but it was, it was a frenetic race, right? It wasn't done with any sense of grounding and and self-knowledge and awareness. It was just done like, it doesn't matter what it is. It's like just a hamster on a wheel. It was, it was what I call the, the hamster wheel or the treadmill. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point, you know, we're, we're getting to my, when I, when I came out at some point, um, I was able to hold that up really well in my twenties and in my thirties and in my early forties. But as I started to hit mid 40, I started to become tired. And the word most people use when they're sort of depressed in general is exhausted and exhaustion because putting up a barricade against your true self and living, you know, a, a, a lie is exhausting, right? You're not working with life. You're working against life. And I was trying to repress this huge um, cauldron of emotion that had never been expressed. And I think it was getting louder and louder. And what started to happen was I felt like the cry of my authentic soul was being quashed and it was crying. It was desperate to come out. And I started reading a lot of stories about people who had sort of come out and made their disclosures, you know, again, still unconsciously. And I was listening to podcasts and I was, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, I think what I was trying to do subconsciously is get the courage to just come out as my true self. And I had listened to a podcast that I was really um, enamored with, and it had all my favorite people sharing, you know, deep, dark stories of self-discovery. And in one really impulsive, non-Melissa moment, I decided I was going to write the host who I did not know, but I had listened to his podcast for years. And I was going to tell him I wanted to be on his show to announce sort of this aha moment, this epiphany that I had had through all my reading, um, I had discovered, and it was through him because he talked about Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning, this book that he loved. And I had this book. I'd read it in my 20s and it really, it was an, an amazing story, but it didn't speak to me at all, which shows how, you know, as your lens of uh, your rose colored glasses, you know, come off, that you see things entirely differently, depending on how much you've evolved. The part of it that that resonated the most wasn't the story itself. It was after he came out, it was like in the yeah. afterward. Uh, he talks about how he really struggled to find meaning. And through that, he founded a school of existential psychotherapy called Logotherapy, which is healing through meaning. And when I read the word existential, I didn't even know what it meant. Existential psychotherapy, existential angst, um, logotherapy. I looked these words up and that's when my life changed. So did you end up going on the podcast? I did. did. I ended up going on the podcast without ever disclosing to anyone in my life that I had connected some dots and I had realized that I had suffered my whole life with a condition called existential depression which is a non-pathological condition that is very rarely diagnosed and no traditional therapist or psychotherapist would ever know about. Yeah. But it's a, it's a crisis of meaning, a meaning crisis where you know that you need to make meaning, but you don't know how to make meaning. And mm -hmm. in that void, that existential void, if you fall into nihilism, which is this mindset that there is no meaning to existence and we as humans have no ability to make meaning in a meaningless existence, though that is where people end their lives. Because if you feel completely disempowered from being able to choose meaning and take responsibility for making meaning, then there really is no point to, to go on. So I was very, I was a nihilist and I was very close to that point. And when I realized that this man, like 
was exactly at that same place and founded a school and that there were others he had he had coined a name for it uh it was mind blowing so mind blowing that i like cried for 3 days oh, gosh. just you felt a release i felt that maybe my curse had a blessing and it wasn't a curse that was a blurse. It was a blessing and a curse. And maybe I started to read that people who experience existential depression also tend to be highly creative because it's that imaginational capacity to see things that also allows you to see things like the hypocrisy of existence. So the fact that maybe the fact maybe the the fact that i could create so easily was because of these stigmatizing characteristics that made living here on earth so challenging and that was the first like huh yeah. wait a second this ability to create which is the most intoxicating euphoric experience um i could ever imagine you know, that comes with this price, huh? That's entirely different. Maybe this darkness that raged through my body, if I could choose how to use it and channel it into tangible products that could touch others, maybe it actually was my conduit to meaning. Wow, that is so powerful. Let's pause with that for a moment. So, your conduit to meaning. Talk me through the Melissa process of you go to your maybe dark place, maybe you call it dark, I'm not sure, but this place of, you know, existential despair. Unsettled. is I call it an unsettledness, a continual yeah. sense of dis-ease yeah. with how things are. Yeah. And you, from that, you, you wrote this beautiful poem. Step out of the head, moving into the heart, free to channel all dread into jubilant art. That really stuck with me. Is that the process in your mind? And talk through that a little bit more in depth, if you don't mind. I don't mind. So one day, so I had never associated myself with even being creative. This is the craziest thing about my life because creativity was associated with weird and odd. And the strange thing about me is I really wanted to be popular. Like I didn't want to be weird and, and odd. I wanted to be one of the most socially acceptable people and be a cheerleader in those days. That's, that was what, you know, women did um, and have a football player boyfriend. Like I wanted all the conventional you know, definitions of success yeah. um, socially. So I didn't want to ever be associated as being creative. Um, and, and those people, by the way, they resonated so deeply with me, but every time I would have a connection, I would be like, I do not want to be like you. Like I was really rude and so mm -hmm. angry that I would even be thought of as someone that I didn't find socially acceptable. That's because how- you that's fear. That's fear talking because you, you had that deep rooted fear that you were not going to be like, yeah, I had this extrinsic need to be perfect socially. And my perfect social definition was to like, be like Barbie, really. Like I loved Barbie as a child and it was like this, this unattainable vision, like everything. And it like, like all perfectionism, right. It was, it was unattainable. So um, I didn't associate with being creative. I didn't use it as any form of channeling or grounding. And the things that came out of me in those days were so dark because what I was trying to do was process this, this, you know, nihilism and try to turn it into answers that could help me find meaning. And mm -hmm. that's what all my verses are doing. As I read them back, even today, I was like, oh my gosh, you knew the answers when you were eight and nine. Like they were answering the questions, but I just didn't ever look at them after I wrote them. I never read or looked at any of the music I wrote, any of the, because it was just darkness. Yeah. So I think, you know, when I experienced my true breakdown in college, because I was 
thinking I was going to be a professional musician and maybe go to Spain and study with one of the classical guitar greats. Um, and I chose uh, to go to college instead. When I did that, I severed all connection, even with music, which I now realize was a lifeline for me. And I anchored at college to performance. I said, I'm going to graduate number one in my class and social acceptance. I'm going to get accepted into the sorority that has the most mm -hmm. like affable, beautiful girls. And I failed. On, I ultimately failed on both fronts. You know, I didn't get into the sorority I wanted. I did get into a sorority of people just like me that I should have been so grateful to be in. But of course, um, because it wasn't the one I believed I should be in, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't go into any and felt the biggest um, sense of rejection that I had ever felt. Being rejected as someone I wasn't, but still yeah. I felt it was the essence of myself who was being That's rejected. So and then I also, um, didn't get all A pluses. I started getting grades that were less than A plus, which meant that I had no worth. And the combination took me uh, the closest to, you know, ending my life that uh, where I had ever been. So I think uh, once I had a, that crash, went, you know, completely broke down, uh, was right after that, I, a couple years after that, there were some more social uh, things that I did. I decided to become an investment banker because again, the extrinsic out of college, like doing every single thing that extrinsically would make me belong. You thought realizing like one by one that one, I wasn't good at these things um, and not, I wasn't meant to do them. They weren't my, my soul's calling. Uh, and, and two, you know, if I'm just chasing the extrinsic, I will never find meaning and I will never find fulfillment and joy. So I think after I had the investment banking experience, um, I was, I really fell into an existential vacuum. And, you know, my, my boyfriend, Doug, at the time, I, I could barely get out of bed. I didn't want to go to work. I couldn't stand what I was doing. What Numbers happened? didn't speak to me. Did you like you weren't what happened with the investment banking thing that was a failure? Purely a failure in that it wasn't my soul's calling. And I did it because uh I tried to go to law school and had a panic attack in the LSAT because again, that wasn't right for me either. So I realized I wasn't gonna go to law school. Then I went to career placement and I said, okay, what is the hardest job to get out of undergrad? And they were looked at me and they were like, the hardest job? I said, yes, what has the lowest odds of getting it? And they said, consulting and investment banking, which by the way, has not changed 30 plus years later. Uh, and so I said, okay, those are the jobs I'm gonna go for. And I remember the woman saying, well, I hope you like numbers because they're both really quantitative. And I was like, of course I like numbers. I just completely, I can't, numbers are not my thing. Words are my thing. And, no, and musical like notes. If you could succeed at the hardest thing, then you would be validated, essentially. Exactly. If I could get the elusive job that was the job to get back in the late 80s, it was when junk bonds and Michael Milken and investment banking was was even like more elusive than consulting. Uh, if I could get that job, then maybe I would finally be acceptable to all these people who, you know, thought me weird and re had rejected me um, socially. So I ended up like becoming an expert at finance and the interview process. And because I am a pleaser. I was really good at interviews because I could tell people exactly what they wanted to hear. And I was a liar too. I was an amazing liar because again, I had to create a facade mm. of who I was. And I knew how to, like, it didn't even touch my soul because it didn't matter. The, 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 the only goal was to achieve the end. Wow. So yeah. I got one of those elusive jobs, at a bunch of them, and I got to pick the investment bank I went to, which I chose the number one in that day, which was Morgan Stanley. And for about three days, I was basking in the glow of acceptance because I truly had achieved what in those days was really challenging. There was only one other person at my whole university 
who, who got one of those jobs. It was two of us. And uh, people were coming up to me like, wow, I don't know how you did it. You, I just have to congratulate you. So, uh, you know, it felt good. I mean, and I understood what it felt like to be sort of accepted at that level, but it was short lived because the truth was the job wasn't utilizing my passions and talents, right? At all. You know, and some people who go into that role, numbers speak to them. They can mold them into beautiful models and things that really change lives and, and help companies. And I admire that. And I was in awe of the people around me, all of whom seemed to be those types. And I was like needing remedial help. Like I didn't even think that way. And I couldn't, they just looked like boring old numbers and they didn't speak to me. And I started to fall back into this meeting crisis, right? Like, mm -hmm. what am I doing if I can't like be excited about investing my finite time in something of meaning each day? So I would was communicating this to Doug. I was really, really miserable, probably at one of the lowest of my whole life. Um, Cause here I had gotten this thing. I was on the top of the mountain and realizing, oh my gosh, this doesn't do anything for me. So we went away for a fateful weekend and said, you know, we're going to do something together. And by the way, I never would have done that. I was so extrinsically motivated that pain was a necessary component for me of being, you know, accepted. I would have stayed there. Absolutely. I would have done the two-year financial analyst. I would have gone to business school. I would have come back as an associate. Like I would have, I would have done the whole thing and who knows, hopefully not still be there, but maybe. Um, but Doug was like, we're, do we're, we're doing something together. And I was like, no, we can't. I have to stay in this place that I can't stand. Um, and we did. We ended up uh, deciding we were going to do something together um, that involved children. And that was when my life began to change. Wow. wow. What a courageous decision. So you promptly quit or and just said, I'm going to go full fetch forward and tap into, you knew you were a creative deep down. At no, this I still didn't know I was a creative. Oh, no, so I really didn't. I didn't associate with it. We just thought we're going to make some products for children. And then little by little, I started pulling from my essence, these little glimmers. You know, our first products were these interactive um, like programs for kids. And I ended up writing all the lyrics and, and singing on the, the soundtrack and starting to pull from my ability to rhyme and create lyrics. And I was like, oh, wow, that was fun. And that was kind of easy. Very cool. And then the the programs, they were a really hard road and very hard to sell. And we were kind of like, what are we going to do now after those? And we had a brainstorm one day driving for a product. And then it was like, huh, this is really amazing. Like we were able to, and then once I saw that product, I was able to see a whole bunch of other products. And suddenly I talk about it like, I had always believed that my creativity only had one faucet and it was a dark faucet. And basically I had darkness raging through me. I turned on the dark faucet and dark darkness raged out of me. Everything I created was something that could never connect to anyone else because it was so dark and despairing. And I was embarrassed to share it with the world. But suddenly now that we had ended up in children's just by accident, by saying, I think this is where we want to put our time because we all we we love children and our parents were all involved in education and we feel like children is something that could give us a reason to get out of bed each morning if we can impact their lives in some small way. Um, suddenly, once I began to see these products in my head, I suddenly was like, wait a second, this is not darkness. This is actually really the the antithesis of darkness. It's light, bright toys, no less like toys, right. which are the most joyful thing you can make. And I thought that was such an irony. Yeah. Then through just the accident of Doug and I deciding to make products for children and starting to see toy products, um, come, come in, come conceive in my, my head. I realized something really profound that probably changed my life more than anything, which is I always felt a victim of the darkness and that I could only sort of say, take me darkness and allow darkness to pour out of me. 
but that actually I had a choice with how I used that energy within and I could either choose to channel it into darkness or I could actually turn that faucet off, turn on a completely new faucet that was the light faucet and channel it just as easily, just by choice through uh, that light faucet and make it turn into tangible form of light, bright products like toys. And that was powerful because it was the first time that I realized that I actually had a choice in how I used those creative seeds that were, you know, deep within me. And knowing you have a choice is empowering and it's the beginning of crafting a life of meaning, realizing that we do have a choice and we can choose to make things really dark or make things really bright. And that if I could take this darkness and use it to some light, bright end that would serve humanity in some small way, then maybe actually the darkness wasn't so dark after all. Maybe it was this, uh, this fodder that could allow me to craft my life purpose and, and uh, bring light into other people's lives. Amazing. And that is just what you've done. I mean, to the fact that you have been, your creative energy has, you know, been put into the homes of so many, so many, and, and brought their children joy. And now your new venture with Lifelines is also an extension of that. It's so beautiful. Um, I would love for you to just leave our listeners, you know, women that are hearing your story, what can you leave with them that will, as they embark on their day after listening to this incredible story, have a little more pep in their step that they can forge ahead? Like we said at the beginning, giving them this this hope that the struggles we face and maybe your story deeply resonates with them specifically, uh, that they can just look ahead with more hope and a little weight off their shoulders. Yeah. I mean, I think it all starts with stopping the feudal race and starting to become self-aware. You know, self-awareness is the first step. So I think change only happens once we stop racing and we have the courage to mm -hmm. make that journey inside. So I would just say to people, I thought that journey inside would be so terrifying and so dark that I raced away from it my whole life, but it was only once I admitted that I need to go inside, I need to really explore all those emotions that I had repressed, I need to accept who Melissa really is before I can do anything of meaning, that was when my life began to change. So I think it takes, and at any point, any of us can make that choice. We mm -hmm. can say, I'm ready to embark on that inner journey. And for me, it took engaging professional help, which was also always a sign of weakness until I finally said, this is the only way I'm going to do it. So yeah. I think knowing that as humans, we do have the ability to channel darkness into light. We have the ability to choose to make meaning. And if you choose to make meaning, that means that if you're deliberate and intentional and committed, you will end up forging a life of meaning, which I think is very empowering. And I think the biggest advice I try to tell everyone is life isn't easy. And we believe one of our fallacies uh, in the Western world is that it's supposed to be a fairy tale. And mm -hmm. without doing anything, we just end up with picket fences and uh, butterflies and rainbows and meadows. And if, if every day isn't like that, something's wrong. But it's mm -hmm. quite the contrary. You know, life is what we make of it and we can choose to make meaning. But if we choose to do so, it's going to take some some deliberate commitment and intention. And we can talk about that in another episode. But there are some very clear steps and a clear practice I have to do that and know that it will take some commitment on your part. But the exciting thing is when you invest, invest your beautiful energy in these life giving and life saving practices, they do lead you to joy, fulfillment, and meaning. 
amazing. And the fact that, you know, the, the, the point of not just hitting a bump or feeling like you are different or and, and, and running away from that, but embracing it, living your truth and figuring out a path forward, even if you come upon challenge after challenge, because as we can see from Melissa's story, there are in the greatest success stories, so many bumps and so many trials and tribulations, but that's part of life. And yeah. Here- And there continue to be bumps. Every day has bumps. So, you know, I wrote a second book, which is my practice. It's called Practice Makes Purpose. Mm -hmm. So that is my own practice that I created just for myself. But when I started to share it, uh, others wanted to sort of know what I did every day to create a life of sort of resilience and meaning and grounding. So it is in a fun written form now. And it's a really good start uh, on your own practice. It really shows you how to create your own practice of purpose. Incredible. And I'm going to be putting links to everything Melissa has going on now in this stage of her life in the bio. And certainly check out her book, Lifelines, as well. It's absolutely incredible. Melissa, thank you for sharing your time and your journey with us. I know that so many who hear your story are going to be gaining such value and also inspiration and hope and encouragement. And that is incredibly powerful. So thank you. You're welcome. Anybody's welcome to email me at melissa at lifelines.com. And I will always respond to anyone just to, you know, show you that we really are very much the same and that no one should ever feel alone. You're an incredible human being. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome, Linda. Thank you for doing something so important to touch people. 